and welcome to the American Society of ECHO E3 lecture series. My name is Lucy Safi and I am Director of Interventional Echocardiography at Hackensack University Medical Center and Chair of the ASC Emerging Echo Enthusiasts, also known as E3 Special Interest Group. This special interest group provides an opportunity for early career physicians, sonographers, and trainees who are interested in echocardiography to present, interact, and discuss echocardiographic topics. Each lecture is formatted as a 30-minute didactic lecture followed by a panel discussion. On the panel will be two moderators, and in this case, two experts in the field. During the discussion section, the panelists will also answer audience questions. So please enter your questions in the Q&A box below. This virtual lecture series will be recorded and later available online via the ASC E3 website. To join E3, log into your ASC account and under Update My Profile, select Specialty Interest Group and then E3. Today's topic will be strain imaging. It is my pleasure to introduce my co-moderator, Dr. Juan Lopez Matei. Dr. Lopez Matei is a multimodality imaging cardiologist. He is also the co-director and co-founder of the MD Anderson Cardiac Radiology Services. He is a member of the ASC Technology Incubator Task Force and member of the Cardio Oncology Special Interest Group. Welcome, Dr. Lopez. Thank you, welcome. For such an important topic, we have two experts today. Our physician expert today is Dr. Marielle Schreier-Crosby. Dr. Schreier-Crosby is the director of Echo Lab at the Hospital of University of Pennsylvania and has a longstanding research interest in the interactions of cancer and cardiovascular diseases. She is the chair of the ASC Registry Research and Publications Committee and a member of the Guidelines Writing Committee and the ASC Cardio Oncology Specialty Interest Group. Welcome, Dr. Schreier Crosby, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Safi. It's my pleasure to be here. Our second expert is Keith Collins. Mr. Collins is the lead cardiac sonographer and advanced imaging educator at Northwestern Medicine at downtown Chicago. Keith is the current chair of the ASC. Sonographer Council, the Sonographer Co-Chair of the ASC Scientific Sessions, and is a member of the ASC Board of Directors. Welcome, Keith. It's great to have you here today. It's great to be here. Thanks. Our guest speaker today is Dr. Nusheen Akhtir. Dr. Akhtir is the Director of Cardio-Oncology at Northwestern Medicine and also serves on the ASC Foundation's Board of Directors. She is a strain enthusiast and is interested in the ways advanced imaging can be used to prevent cancer therapy-related cardiotoxicities. Welcome, Dr. Akhtir. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Lucy. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak on a favorite topic. I look forward to a vigorous discussion afterwards with our moderators and our um, outstanding experts. Mm -hmm. Okay, in order to understand strain, we must start with an overview of cardiac architecture. The myocardial fiber orientation is orderly from the endocardium to the epicardium. The endocardial fibers run along a long longitudinal fashion and the mid wall fibers in a circumferential fashion. The fiber direction changes from a right-handed helix in the subendocardium to a left-handed helix in the subepicardium. Myocardial contraction propagates in an orderly fashion along the myocardial band, starting from the pulmonic valve down the descending loop, the base moves towards the apex in a clockwise direction, and the apex then moves towards the base up the ascending loop in a counterclockwise direction. The entire LRV and LV myocardium is consistent of one um, myocardial band that is wound up like a turban. When unraveling the heart, we see this beautiful complex relationship of the myocardial fibers that result in two opposing helices that result in contraction. The ASC put this definition for, the can for cancer therapeutics related cardiac dysfunction as part of its 2014 expert consensus statement, which states that it is a decrease in EF of greater than 10% to a value less than 53%. It is important to note that strain is not included in this definition and that cancer therapy related decisions should not be based on strain. 
Although LVEF is a robust measure, there are limitations. Subtle changes in LV function may not be detected by EF. Image quality and precise endocardial border definition may be problematic. This is especially true in our breast cancer patients who have post-mastectomy, radiation, implanter, implants, and expanders. There may be an inability to visualize the true LV apex, loading condition changes, and measurement variability. So what is strain? Strain is a tool that is used to characterize biocardial deformation. Wall motion cannot distinguish between active and passive motion, but deformation can distinguish between these two, and strain is not affected by translational motion or tethering. The definition for myocardial deformation or strain is very simple. It is the total deformation during the cardiac cycle relative to the initial length. It is a dimensionless percentage, dimensionless percentage and strain rate is the speed of deformation over time. This is a cartoon um, courtesy of my friend, Dr. Ben Freed, which is essentially a, a, a pictorial depiction of strain. It is a chain, percent change in length of the myocardium during relaxation and contraction. There are two methods to obtaining strain, tissue Doppler and speckle tracking. Tissue Doppler is single dimensional. It, 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 the alignment of the ultrasound beam with the wall is important and therefore there are limitations with measuring velocity if it is not aligned um, with the wall motion and the velocity may be underestimated. It is angle dependent and primarily used for longitudinal strain. There is no retrospective act application. The inter-observer variability is between 10 and 15%. We are primarily using speckle tracking tra strain. Speckle tracking utilizes the natural acoustic markers in the myocardium, which are the speckles distributed throughout the myocardium and tra tracks the displacement of these speckled patterns following the myocardial movement. It is angle independent, provides longitudinal circumferential and radial strain, and there, is a retros there can be a retrospective application. The inter-observer var variability is between seven and 11.8%. There are three primary strain vectors. The longitudinal vector, which is um, running again along the end endocardium and is a negative strain. The circumferential uh, vector, which circumferential and the radial vectors are obtained on the um, peristernal short axis window. Circumferential is a negative strain and radial is positive strain, which represents the thickening of the myocardium. There are several factors that can affect strain in our cardio-oncology patient population that are critically important to consider. Hypovolemia can cause a decrease in strain, increase in afterload by new or worsening hypertension due to certain cancer therapies can cause a decrease in strain, changes in the chamber geometry within LV dilation can cause a decreased strain. It is also important to consider personal cardiovascular risk factors and prior cardiotoxic treatments. I won't spend much time on how to obtain GLS, um, and that may be uh, something we can discuss further in the discussion. But essentially, you select the appropriate image, define images, define the aortic valve closure, mark the mitral annulus and apex, trace the endocardial border, adjust the region of interest, and then assess and approve the myocardial tracking. How to optimize GLS. Um, one of the things that we do in our lab is to obtain the three long axis images together at the end of the study to ensure similar um, frames, range of frames per second. It's important that the frames per second be between 40 and 90 frames per second. And to acquire the uh, three, acquire at least a minimum of three cardiac cycles and document the blood pressure. It's also important not to exclude any part of the heart um, from the picture and to narrow the sector to um, inc include the LV and focus on the LV if, if, you, if you're obtaining LV um, longitudinal strain. Um, additionally, when the automatic tracking verification does not fit with your visual impression, then adjust the region of if interest to optimize the tracking. Use as little as possible outside of the region of interest. Do not use include the pericardium or the papillary muscles. Also to note, if the image is foreshortened, that can affect the apical strain values and cause an overestimation of the strain values. 
Also note the, uh, if there's improper timing of the aortic valve closure that can lead to incorrect strain as shown here in the um, picture depiction that the aortic valve closure is not at, at the end systolic um, point. If the 2D image is of poor quality, do not attempt strain. This is a very nice summary of the strengths and limitations of strain that was in a review in Jack Cardio Oncology by Drs. Lou Barak, Thavinder Nathan, and Shira Crosby. Um, they have some very nice online examples of how to optimize strain. I would encourage everyone in this audience to review it. Strain is highly dependent on image quality and windows, and post-processing is also dependent on operator uh, skill, but that can improve with experience. There's also differences in vendors and software, um, and we have a strain standardization task force that is working on this. The ASE put forth this cardio-oncology echo protocol. Essentially, it's just get the best 2D or 3D ejection fraction possible um, and include strain if your lab is able to do that. Normal ranges for left ventricular strain are, are mentioned here uh, in this meta-analysis done by Dr. Marwick and colleague looking at 24 studies uh, with over 2,500 patients. Normal global longitudinal strain is negative 20 plus minus 2%. When reporting strain, review all of the strain curves for accuracy. Report the average and systolic global longitudinal strain. Report the change in strain from baseline in the comparison statement. That's especially important in our cardio-oncology patient uh, reports. Describe any patterns that you see on the bull's eye um, and capture a frame of both the strain curves and the bull's eye for the, um, the physician readers to review. We published this um, review of the diagnostic and prognostic value of strain in JAMA cardiology. Um, and these are just some examples of um, di the diagnostic value of strain patterns on the bullseye plot. On the left, you see uh, examples of is um, ischemic uh, pattern changes. And on the right, you see some examples of Takotsubo variants, the top being the traditional apical variant and the bottom, an example of recovery in a patient with reverse Takotsubo. Strain uh, is also particularly helpful in our patients with left ventricular hypertrophy. Um, and in this, and these examples you see on the top, an example of a patient with cardiac amyloidosis and the bullseye plot showing apical preservation or also a cherry on top. On the bottom, you have two examples of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with the traditional hypertrophy of the septum and decreased strain, and um, an example of a patient with apical hypertrophy and a, an apical aneurysm. What is the role of strain in cancer therapy? Well, the utility of strain must be considered across the cancer care continuum before, during, and after cancer therapy, and its use is primarily in prognostication and prevention. Strain is especially useful in patients whose ejection fraction ranges between 50 and 59 percent. In this group, strain can be used as a second objective marker of cardiac function. The question is, what do we do with these patients um, if the strain is abnormal? Do we optimize risk factors, consider closer surveillance, consider starting cardioprotective therapy? These are all areas of active research. So let's present a case. A 72-year-old physician with um, AML um, uh, is admitted to the hospital and you are asked to see him for pre-op uh, or pre-chemo cardiac risk assessment. Um, his baseline ejection fraction is normal at 65%. He exercises regularly without cardiac symptoms. The planned treatment is with induction chemotherapy 7 plus 3, which includes his donor rubicin at 180 milligrams per meter squared. He has several cardiovascular risk factors, including his age, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. However, he's never a smoker and there's no family history. His pre-chemotherapy cardiac um, risk assessment also includes his baseline GLS at a negative 14.7%. This was an excellent editorial by Dr. Lopez Mate um, in Jack Cardio Oncology discussing the idea of the baseline GLS that can be used to identify the vulnerable patient prior to cardiotoxic chemotherapy. And the idea is that the abnormal GLS in patients with preserved EF may identify patients with more comorbidities or reduced contractile reserve. And therefore, we may 
consider these patients as having the equivalent of a CCAHA stage B heart failure. Dr. Scherer, Crosby, and colleagues demonstrated that the baseline GLS in patients with leukemia or lymphoma was predictive of cardiac events. They looked at 450 patients with leukemia and lymphoma that were treated with anthracycline and followed for four to five years. They found a 6% cardiac event rate. Uh, cardiac events included death, cardiac death and symptomatic heart failure. Diabetes and hypertension were the primary risk factors. And they found that a cutoff baseline GLS of less than negative 17.5% was associated with a six-fold increase in cardiac events. Her group also, um, and, and Yu Kang, also came up with a 21-point risk score incorporating baseline GLS of greater than negative 15% LVEF and clinical risk factors to identify patients with acute leukemia who are at risk for development of heart failure. The risk score was able to separate out risk groups into high, moderate, and low risk for development of heart failure. Of note, the risk calculator still needs perspective external validation. We have done a, a retrospective validation of the risk score on a cohort of 204 patients with AML. 21% of our patients were hospitalized were for heart failure, and we're able to demonstrate that there was a significant association between heart failure and the risk group categories when employing the risk score. GLS has been studied primarily in patients with malignancies employing anthracycline and trastuzumab. The absolute on-treatment GLS and the relative change in GLS from baseline both have good prognostic performance for the de subsequent development of CTRCD. This is really important in, in terms of practical considerations uh, when there's no comparison echo or a patient may have metastatic disease and is on treatment for years in which there's no baseline echo to compare to. These authors did point out some limitations to the studies in the, that were um, included in the meta-analysis, that there was limited data on optimal cutoff values, there's a need for large prospective studies, and there was also some concern for publication bias. Turning back to our patient, his post-induction ejection fraction is now 50 to 55%. The post-treatment course was complicated uh, by some colon abscesses requiring exploratory laparotomy and a need for sigmoid colectomy with colostomy. So his post-chemo pre-op echo prior to colectomy demonstrated an EF of 50 to 55%. GDMT was not started at this time. His post-induction GLS was negative 11.5%. Five months later, he wakes up with shortness of breath and is admitted to an outside hospital with new onset heart failure. The echo at that time demonstrates an ejection fraction that's reduced to 30%. Elevated BMP and troponin, he is hospitalized uh, and um, optimized with diuresis, GDMT is initiated, a left heart cath is done, which shows non-obstructive CAD. A cardiac MRI is also obtained, which cons uh, obtained which confirms a moderate LV enlargement, LVEF of 22%. The RV is also reduced uh, in function. There's no evidence of edema or diffuse scar, but there was a nonspecific finding of remote myocarditis. Three years now into survivorship, his ejection fraction is still mildly reduced. He's mostly sedentary now, but denies any heart failure symptoms. The prognostic utility of global longitudinal strain during breast cancer therapy was um, demonstrated in several papers that were published between 2011 and 2013. And these papers are really the backbone for the AAC consensus statement. Dr. Shira Crosby um, also found that monitoring GLS with speckle tracking could identify patients at risk for anthracycline cardiotoxicity and demonstrated that changes in strain predated changes in LV ejection fraction. So GLS became this early predictor for cardiotoxicity with sensitivity ranging between 66 to 80% and specificity between 73 to 95% with a very high negative predictive value. There was another stu study published in breast cancer patients that demonstrated that changes in longitudinal strain preceded changes in circumferential strain in patients who developed CTRCD. And these changes may affect um, the duration of heart failure therapy. 
the concept of subclinical LV dysfunction was first described in this um, ASC in the ASC consensus statement, and essentially is a 15% change in relative strain from baseline in patients who do not meet the criteria for CTRCD by LVEF. Let's move to our second case. A 48-year-old female with a history of left-sided breast cancer. She's ER positive, PR negative, and HER2 negative. Her breast cancer was diagnosed initially in 2009. She was treated with a bilateral mastectomy and adjuvant ACT, which includes adriamycin, a total dose of 240 milligrams per meter squared, cyclophosphamide, and taxol. She had bilateral implant reconstructions and was given um, adjuvant tamoxifen. Unfortunately, a decade later, she is found to have a new primary at the lateral aspect of her left breast reconstruction and um, now she's HER2 positive. She undergoes a, a wide excision, including skeletal muscle um, with negative margins and is started on TCHP, which includes docetaxel, carbolo, carboplatinum, trastuzumab, and pertuzumab, which are both anti-HER2 agents. Her baseline echo demonstrates an ejection fraction of 70% and a global longitudinal strain of negative 20.2%. On anti-HER2 therapy, the FDA recommends an echo at every three months to monitor for CTRCD. At our three-month echo, we find an EF um, is lower as well as a GLS, but the EF is still in a normal range at 58% with a GLS of negative 16.3%. This is about a 19% relative change in GLS and does fit the criteria for subclinical LV dysfunction. I think this is a good point for us to discuss the SECOR study. The SECOR study was recently published evaluating EF surveillance versus strain surveillance. It was an international multi-center study of 28 sites. They randomized 331 patients, 166 to the GLS arm and 165 to the EF arm. There was a low dropout between arms. This study included a very high risk patient cohort. All of the patients um, enrolled were treated with anthracyclines and 88% had HER2 positive breast cancer. Um, there were very few patients with lymphoma or leukemia included. Heart failure risk factors were also prevalent. 29% had hypertension and 13% had diabetes. The primary endpoint was a 3D ejection fraction at one year. Their um, criteria for CTRCD was a symptomatic drop in EF of greater than 5% or an asymptomatic drop of greater than 10% to a baseline of less than 55%. And the GLS arm, they used the cutoff of greater than or equal to 12% relative reduction um, at any follow-up time point. At the one-year follow-up, the primary end outcome of change in 3D EF was not significantly different. There was a significantly greater use of cardioprotective therapy and fewer patients met the CTRCD criteria in the GLS guided arm than the EF guided arm. Patients who received cardioprotective therapy in the EF guided arm had a larger reduction in the EF at the follow-up than the GLS guided arm. Cancer therapy was, um, e there was no significant difference between um, arms uh, with regards to cancer therapy interruptions or discontinuation, and there was one clinical heart failure in both arms. With this in mind, let's return to our patient. Her next echo was obtained after a two-month interval, so a somewhat shorter surveillance and did demonstrate a reduction in her ejection fraction to 47% with a GLS of negative 14.7%. But importantly, she also endorsed shortness of breath um, and chest tightness. And so her chemotherapy was held and she was started on carvedilol. Her GDMT was limited by hypotension. Stress test was done as her next ejection fraction assessment due to prior history of left-sided radiation um, in 2009, which demonstrated no ischemia and an improvement in EF to 50 to 55%. So she was re-challenged by um, oncology with uh, a version of trastuzumab called adotrastuzumab. It's important to know that trastuzumab is the most cardiotoxic of all the anti-HER2 therapies, and newer agents have less cardiotoxicity. Adotrastuzumab has up to 1.8% um, cardiotoxicity. Trastuzumab causes primarily an asymptomatic reduction in LV function, and clinical heart failure is more rare. It is not related to cumulative dose and largely reversible. We see higher rates when used sequentially with anthracyclines, as shown here. 
that the probability for CTR CD is highest when the regimen includes um, anthracycline followed by trastuzumab. Also in those patients, the post-anthracycline ejection fraction can be predictive of trastuzumab cardiotoxicity. Our patient is now on adotrazduzumab and being surveillance at every three months. Her ejection fraction is 54% with a GLS of negative 15.9%. Um, and so she's continued on treatment. At her 11 month echo, we see this very interesting um, new bullseye plot that demonstrates kind of red in the middle and blue on the outer edges. And so we scratch our head, but the, these, this is an example of a patient um, bullseye plot who has a breast implant artifact. As you can see here, the acoustic shadow that uh, hovers along the base of the heart is causing the, the blue or the dyskinetic segments that are not tracking well um, on the uh, bullseye. So strain imaging can be very difficult, especially in our breast cancer patient population, as previously discussed. Um, we sought to evaluate the feasibility of sort of a new idea uh, of left ventricular longitudinal strain from the subcostal view and came up with a protocol that was published in JACE to evaluate the feasibility of measuring a three chamber and a four chamber um, longitudinal strain from the subcostal window in 68 patients with breast cancer and 110 echocardiograms. A hundred of these were feasible studies and we found that there was good feasibility in the subcostal three chamber and four chamber views at 93.6% and 96.3% respectively. There was a high degree of reliability and good agreement between the apical and subcostal measurements as well. Dr. Shira Crosby has also demonstrated that the post-treatment GLS can be used to predict LV recovery. Um, and this study looking at 95 patients with breast cancer, and she found that at the point that the patient was diagnosed with cardiotoxicity, if the GLS was a greater than 15.8% cutoff in this study, that it was uh, that these patients um, demonstrated reversible cardiotoxicity. I'd like to very quickly talk about some novel applications of strain in anti-cancer therapies. Immune checkpoint inhibitors are the new category of, of drugs that were approved in 2014. They it can cause multi-organ immune-mediated side effects, but from a cardiac perspective, myocarditis, although rare, can be fatal and has raised some alarm. These patients can also develop non-inflammatory cardiomyopathies, stress cardiomyopathies, and accelerated atherosclerotic disease. ICI myocarditis is rare, but the mortality is high. Um, and it occurs early, the median uh, time to onset was 34 days in this a study published by Dr. Mahmoud and all and Jack. And nearly all cases had abnormal troponin and EKG. But importantly, 50% of patients had normal LVEF. And so this led to the question, can GLS be useful in this patient population? And this study was done by Dr. Tom Nealon and colleagues looking at the utility of GLS in patients with clinically suspected ICI myocarditis. In this retrospective multi-center study, found that a lower GLS by echo was predictive of MACE in both patients with normal and abnormal LVEF. And what about other cancer therapies? This study was led by Dr. Sharon Mulvag and colleagues looking at the utility of GLS in VEGF inhibitors. Um, and they included patients treated with sudanitinib, pazapinib, and bevacizumab, 40 patients at two centers. Um, it was a prospective study that, got, uh, that um, obtained echoes at baseline one month, three month, and six months. And they found that there was an 8% 8 rate of asymptomatic uh, CTRCD. However, 30% of their patients had abnormal decrease in GLS and also abnormal baseline GLS in this patient population also increased the risk for CTRCD. Um, ibrutinib is another drug that's given to patients with CLL that puts the, uh, that um, increases the risk of atrial fibrillation in about a 10% range. Um, and we looked at the utility of left atrial strain in on a pre-op or pre sorry pretreatment echocardiograms in patients who um, went on to develop um, AFib. Now this is a retrospective study if patients do not routinely get a pretreatment echo um, with this agent. Um, and so there may be some selection bias here. We found that the patients um, 
uh, who were older and had mo more comorbidities. And also on the baseline echo, there was an E over E prime that was increased in those patients who developed AFib. We demonstrated that an impaired uh, booster strain identified patients with poor atrial contractile function, which predisposed them to development of ibrutinib-related AFib that was independent of patient age after a multivariate analysis. Um, finally, I just want to touch on RV strain, um, and RV strain has also been looked at in patients uh, treated with anthracycline, and this patient group was um, uh, 74 patients with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma with RCHOP after six cycles, um, which is given with uh, uh, was a total of six cycles. These patients um, were imaged at a time point zero and then after every two cycles until completion, you find they found that after uh, at time point two, um, after four cycles, there was evidence of RV dilation and a decrease in RV free wall strain um, that then resulted at a completion of a, a decrease in RVEF. So to summarize, um, it's important to contextualize GLS. Um, I think that's one of the uh, primary things to take away from um, the talk today and, uh, and to really think about its interpretation based on the cardiac condition. For cancer therapy, it is important to know the time point of the echo during treatment and the treatment regimen history. Strain pattern on the polar map is also important, a diagnostic tool. Pre-treatment GLS can identify patients at risk for cardiotoxicity. This has been shown, um, especially in patients with leukemia and lymphoma. Absolute on-treatment GLS and a relative change in GLS from baseline can be used for prognostication. On anti-cancer therapy, this has been shown mostly in patients uh, with cancer subtypes using anthracycline and trastuzumab. The SACOR study demonstrated GLS surveillance detected more cardiotoxicity than EF surveillance, but the final EF was no different between surveillance groups at one year. And then finally, just there's lots of opportunities for research and studying strain with novel cancer therapies, investigating GLS cutoffs throughout the cancer care continuum and the utility of LA and RV strain. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Very great talk. Um, so many questions are running through my head and that was such a great talk. Um, you know, I wanted to ask the first question, um, Dr. Shari Krause, if I may, you know, you're as director of the lab at uh, Hospital University of Pennsylvania, how do you um, account for um, reader variability and vendor variability for your strain reporting? Yeah, so that's, that's an excellent question. So, um, you know, one of the reasons I think why strain has had some, you know, growing pains into coming into clinical practice is, um, is the variability. Um, and also the difficulty in knowing what is a normal value or an abnormal value. And so um, what we do, so, so let's take the first, uh, the first uh, question, the variability. Um, so um, in our lab, we, we are a. We have several types of machines. Um, you know, we we're not a one vendor lab, uh, so it gets very difficult to compare strain done on a GE machine to strain done on a Philips machine. Um, so one of the things that we do, uh, but we have a majority of of one vendor, so we tend to um, to use hopefully the same vendor in the patient serially. Uh, that's one thing. Um, the other thing is that um, so our sonographers are the ones who measure the strain. And so we're very careful about uh, the tracking. Uh, we need to see the moving loops. Um, and if the tracking is not good, um, we quickly move to a vendor independent uh, software and remeasure it. Um, now, um, you know, there is, there is something that we do that is controversial, but, um, but I, will, I, will, I will still say it. So, you know, there's a lot of literature to say that, you know, the decrease in strain is, uh, you know, a, a very um, a potent marker of uh, cardiotoxicity um, and, um, and clinical, uh, subclinical dysfunction. Um, 
I, I work in the same uh, hospital as Bonnie Key, who is our uh, director of cardio-oncology and who has also worked, uh, you know, for a long time on strain. And, and we agreed that in our hospital anyway, the variability of strain is such that we prefer to report absolute values uh, rather than reporting uh, decreases as, you know, we are not totally confident that the variability wouldn't be uh, too high. So the values that we use, and, and that again has been actually, you know, that's, that's what we uh, uh, reported in the, the papers that we published with uh, Jennifer Liu, and uh, recently uh, the team of Tom Marwick has um, uh, reported in a, a letter to the editor in, in Jack um, uh, Cardiovascular Imaging, a similar idea, and I would be very uh, interested in hearing, obviously, what the other members of the panel uh, do, uh, but that, you know, a strain that is less than minus 16%, um, if well tracked, the concern, um, 16 to 18, 16 to 19, depending, again, the strain depends on the age and on the gender, but mainly on the age. And so, you know, you have to take this into account, the strain at 17% in a young adult is probably not totally normal yeah so but 16 to 18 19 we call borderline and then higher than 19 20 we call normal so uh that is what we do it's it's uh it's our experience uh and i would be very uh interested in hearing what our other panelists are doing <laughs> Sure. I mean, this is this is a you know a great point that you bring. You know, we uh, personally in our lab, uh, we do strain uh, in many cases, and you know we report absolute values. Uh, and the hard work <laughs> initially is done by the by the technician, which leads me to the next question, where uh, for Keith. Um, so uh, I wanted to ask you, Keith. Um, First, what are the challenges of uh, the post-processing that you encounter when you're, uh, after you scan the study? Uh, uh, and what is the learning curve for a sonographer, say that, you know, and, and, and a physician that wants to start their practice with strain? What, what, what do you think is like a, the, usually the learning curve in your experience? Those are great questions. As part of training new people, we always make sure that uh, they know to be pure about it. You need a good solid four, two, three with a, a clean cavity. So it's not fooled by papillary muscles or cordae or you know, it getting in the way. Also being really cognizant of the frame rate while you're acquiring. I think Dr. Octor was talking about that, that we try to take them all together. When they're in AFib or there's a lot of ectopy, that it always throws people off. But we do a lot of 3D imaging and we will take a 3D um, triplane model and that way we're sure that they're all at the same heart rate, making sure that we see the walls in every view and use that. We do a check recheck while we're training um, new people. They usually get on board. There's times we remeasure, uh, just the same as Dr. Sherikoroski, we'll take it to an offline party if we just don't buy it. But it's really critical to show those curves and, and also the tracking so that it's trustworthy because you don't want to garbage in, garbage out. It's not something to race through. Um, a lot of these patients do not have the best windows. So you, like Dr. Doctor was saying, we've done, they, she did a great study in the breast cancer patients, they, in the subcostal four and, and three is a good surrogate. And we, you know, to do that, taking things off axis, because it, if you have to, um, is important when you need to know, is there a difference? So there, it's, it's a learning curve. I think practice makes perfect. I like all things in echo practice makes perfect, but also uh, checking yourself. It's not something to race through. De definitely. And, you know, one thing that, you know, I don't know how you guys handle this, you know, and I'm kind of going to do an open question. Maybe now you know, she can think about, uh, can tell me how she feels about this, but we, we all, we know that 
strain like ejection fraction, you know, there's some uh, preload and afterload consideration that you have to, you know, uh, you know, kind of wait when you're looking at, at the clinical study, right? But before or during the acquisition where, you know, you kind of eyeball the patient and you can sense what's going on, especially if the patient uh, blood pressure is very high, you know, like someone with a systolic blood pressure of the 160 that previously blood pressure was not like that. So that's, to me, that's the, the patient that probably doesn't need strain because the changes that you see could be misleading, but I don't know how, how you tackle that or how, how, how will you address that, those challenging cases where you feel that, you know, you know something is going on and the patient in the protocol has strained, how you address those cases? Now, Shin. Sorry, I was unmuting myself. Um, yeah, I think that if you do notice changes, hemodynamic changes that may potentially have affected the strain when reviewing um, the report, you know, we do include the blood pressure on every patient. Um, but it, it does call into question that strain value and whether or not that should be repeated um, if, you know, once the blood pressure is better controlled or if the patient was dehydrated that day um, to reconsider doing another study, maybe a limited study, if that is um, something that's, you know, that needs to be um, uh, more accurately assessed. So I have done that before. Um, in patients where the strain was very, very different from previous strain, and um, we think it might have been related to hemodynamic variation. And Maria? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. Um, we haven't repeated uh, a study specifically for that. Um, uh, yet, um, but uh, we certainly, uh, you know, if there is, a, especially if, if there's a big change in the strain, although we don't, as I say, we don't tend to report it, but we try to find a reason um, why the value would be so different from the last time. Right, and uh, and one of the things, and, and I, I would love to uh, here the, the, the takes, different takes on, on the SOCOR trial, but actually I would like to hear, uh, you know, from uh, Marielle, you know, uh, like a quick take on, on the SOCOR trial, because I, you know, you, we, we recognize you as an expert in developing the field where, where it went to, that they had to do this stu that study like this, so I, I would like to see what, what are your thoughts about it. Yeah, well, you know, I have to say that um, the SOCOR trial was a very, you know, important study and very well done. And I, I have great admiration that they pulled it off because <laughs> it's very tough. Um, the results, I cannot say the results were, were positive. You know, you can turn the data however you want to turn it. But, um, you know, basically what we're finding is that, so there are more patients who get cardio protection, you know, um, uh, if we base ourselves on strain, and then, you know, they decrease their LVEF less, um, you know, but then there are more of them, you know, that you put on cardio protection. So it, it's hard to conclude without a control group um, of patients that you would have, you know, monitored the strain and not given the cardio protection unless the EF was down. Um, it's hard to conclude whether, you know, it was beneficial or if we're just, um, you know, giving protection to more patients, yeah. Uh, in which case, um, you know, it's sort of, it doesn't, doesn't really prove the point. I don't think it completely disproves it, again, because there was no control group. And, and you know, it was a very tough study to do. So, you know, I'm not trying to, um, you know, to, to second guess, you know, what sure. should have been done or something. But, but you know, that's, that's the bottom line is that it hasn't proven that, um, that if you you base yourself on strain, you'll have, you know, better um, outcomes. Now, the one thing I, I want to say is that it doesn't change um, where I think the most value for the strain is, which is in a group of patients who have 
um, a sort of lowish ejection fraction. Now you can always agree about the numbers and then this is an impossible debate. Yeah, if it's 53 or 52 or 55, whatever. Mm -hmm. But you know, when you're in the range of sort of 50 to 55, sort of, you know, um, then I think the strain has a lot of value because it does give you an extra argument to think, you know, if the strain is really totally normal, like in the 20s, then it's reassuring, um, you know, and, and, and you can sort of relax, yeah? Uh, if the strain is really abnormal, you know, it does happen. So then, you know, you might, you might be more inclined to, to follow up those patients. And again, I would be, I would be happy to hear, you know, the thoughts of, of our other experts in that particular question. Sure. Now, Sheen, what do you think? Anna, I was going to ask you, what do you think? Me? Uh, <laughs> but um, I agree. I agree. I think we need lar a large prospective study with a control arm. And, um, and the authors of the SECOR study themselves say that they w this was not designed as an interventional study. So they weren't they're really looking at um, you know, whether strain surveillance versus the two types of surveillance, um, what would be the outcome based on that? Um, however, it was surprising results um, that, you know, the, the patients who um, were a high risk patient cohort, they all had anthracycline, they all had cardiovascular comorbidities. Um, so they picked a, a high risk group. Um, they, they picked a group that had um, um, were rich in cardiotoxic uh, treatment, and um, and um, despite finding more cardiotoxicity and more treatment with cardioprotective therapy, there was no change in in VF at one year. Yeah, you know what? what there, there's a couple of questions that just got in, and and I'm gonna uh, take those because uh, it's related to to the topic that we're discussing. Like for example. Uh, Marian uh, said, "Ask how do you explain the no change one year of uh, uh, of ejection fraction one year in the support trial? Like they're asking why there was not a significant difference between the EF guided and the GLS guided approach for cardioprotection. And my my take, you know, you know, kind of, I'm gonna share with you my viewpoint. And my viewpoint is that this uh, GLS." Uh, it works in the sense that, and we have seen cases where the EF is still normal, the strain goes down, and then, you know, the ejection fraction falls. You know, the, this prediction of cardiotoxicity, it works, has been proven before. The issue is that in the context of a prospective trial, you know, uh, where you have patients that are not necessarily are incident heart failure, you know, uh, because this is not like a, you know, like a, like a high you know, um, cohort, like a, like a large uh, number of patients, you know, it tends to be smaller series of prospect, uh, perspective. You know, the issue is that you don't have incident heart failure as, a, as an outcome, right? Uh, and because you're not looking for that, you're just looking for a change and to see how you can prevent some change in ejection fraction. So the issue is that, to me, I think that strain can detect cardiotoxicity very well, but it also is so sensitive that it's, it can detect also these changes in volume, like hypovolemia, patients that are pretty nauseous and they are not uh, uh, feeding properly and all this. And I think that when you when you have both situations going on and changes like that, then it's, it's a little bit harder, you know, especially in a, in a you know, small, uh, 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 study or it, it, it's not small, it was powered, but but it's not like a, I think that if you do like a really, really large study with incident heart failure and all these variables, I think you're going to see very strong signals. But the issue is that, uh -huh. Mario, you want to say something? Yes. When you're done, but, when you're done. No, but, but you know, but my take yeah. is that I think that the, that the sub vulnerability of strain uh, to these changes in volume, I think that's probably why you know you didn't. There, there was not a significant difference because because really you were having in probably you know in in the GLS guided arm you were having just uh, patients that had drops because of volume and drops because of cardiotoxicity. That's what I you know think. 
Yeah, so the point I wanted to make, because it is important, and, and there was an editorial that was that was accompanying the Sukor trial, which was a very harsh, uh, um, unnecessarily harsh uh, editorial, I thought, but uh, many people thought that too. Uh, but anyway, um, one thing that they said, and I, I do agree, they have a point. So, um, you know, the, the one thing that I think is very important is not to stop the therapy. Um, just for a decrease in strain. And, you know, they were making the point that there might have been slightly more people, although it was not significant. But in the group that was strain-based, uh, you know, who had interruption of their therapy, uh, basically the trastuzumab, because that always happened after the anthracycline. And, and we do know that, you know, the interruption of the trastuzumab is probably not a good thing from a cancer perspective. So I think we have to be careful not to interrupt the treatment. I agree. Now, Sheen, you yeah, have something? Yeah, just, just a quick point. Um, I, I believe that everyone who had the uh, their cancer therapy held in the strain arm, though, didn't meet the EF criteria. Um, so it wasn't just based on strain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wanted, I wanted to just pivot very quickly um, to Keith. There's a couple of questions from our sonographers who are listening on um, that I wanted to ask your opinion on. Um, so they, they want to know any advice that you may have in patients that have atrial fibrillation where it's hard to have um, similar heart rates in the three views. What do you recommend in situations like that? Yeah, it is one of the challenges because a lot of these people have um, just really a lot of ectopy. Um, going for similar, similar heart rates, we again, Nashin has mentioned that we take three beat loops, but we'll truncate it to the one beats that are similar, or we do do a 3D volume uh, triplane view to get that similar heart rate. It can be a challenge. Um, it has to be a patient. So uh, we actually, when you wait out and you do have something normal sinus-ish, that's when we grab our 423 and making sure they're not for shortened. Um, I think I also saw one in the chat and it goes, it relates to this, like the, if you have to use contrast, but you still need strain. It's not ready for prime time yet. There is some research being done on, on algorithms that can use strain with contrast, but that's not out there commercially available. In the meantime, you're forced to try to non-foreshorten the picture and keep all the walls in. That's one of the biggest challenges I think that we face um, because then you deal with the, the natural effect. You don't want to do a foreshortened image, especially with global longitudinal strain. You're going from the apex and seeing the deformation. So um, it's one of the challenges um, that we're still working with. And is that usually when you recommend that they go to alternative alpha axis views, like maybe subcostal or? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so if you have any other questions, you can feel free to go ahead and answer them or enter them in the Q&A box. Um, I wanted to just circle back on the conversation we were having earlier, you know, not using strain strictly for um, treatment. Um, you know, how often do you get uh, echocardiograms on these patients? And do you book, you know, serial echoes um, on the same machine? And then do you report you know, which machine was used in your report? How do you, you know, in terms of following these patients closely, how do you maintain that consistency? Mon, mean, why don't we start with you? Oh, sorry, Marielle, you can, no, you can no, go, go ahead. ahead. Sure, I mean, you know, I, I'll, I'll be honest, you know, our lab is very VC, you know, it's very hard to get the same tech, the same machine. The, the workflow doesn't allow to that. We're in a cancer center, where, but we do, you know, over 30,000, you know, echo studies, you know, and there's a lot of clinical trials, a lot of things going on. So, you know, we, unfortunately, we don't, we, we, we do use the GE machines uh, exclusively uh, to do uh, GLS and, and 3D uh, ejection fraction, but, you know, we don't really uh, have the same sonographer in the same machine, you know, uh, for, for, for the same patient, but yeah, I'm happy to hear other thoughts. I think that's where the reality hits the theory. 
Um, yep. I mean, we 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 try our best. Um, you know, as I say, we we mainly report the absolute values. Um, you know, I. I retrace when when it's not well tracked, um, and so then it's vendor independent, and I, I trust the tracing that we're doing, and and you know that's basically what what I do for for those patients, and how often we monitor them. Um, well, it's really a, you know a, a a big concern, but that's very rare. Yeah, that the strain would be really very low. Um, you know, I, I from rarely I have given phone calls to to let the oncologist know, but very rarely. Mm -hmm. And do you strain for all your cancer follow up echoes? Not not yes. all the follow ups. Uh, I mean, on, only the so it depends. For example, uh, I'm saying my place. You know, our patients sometimes they come because they have effusion. Depending on the indication, if they're uh, receiving cardiotoxin medication, yes, but there's a lot of other, you know, as you well know, other situations going on. So not necessarily in all patients get strained. What about um, in other labs? Yeah, then we try to do it on, on, on all our cancer patients. But I mean, Juan is, is right. I mean, if they come for tamponade, then we're right. not going to bother uh, so much about it. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're the same at our lab as well, that if the patient is on um, cancer therapy, the echo can be ordered with strains so that signals whether or not that's in, uh, necessary for the, um, the provider to know that information. Um, but we are trying to do strain on as many echoes as possible now, um, regardless of indication. <laughs> Yeah, right. I was going to jump in and say that I think it's so important for the sonographers to yeah. repetition and learning. So then when they are challenging cases, you know how to modify, you know how to go and get that. So we do it for most of RV strain as well. You know, you see a big right side, you see a McConnell sign, you do, do strain. So then when it is a heart transplant and there is a risk of, in, of rejection, right sided thing, strain might indicate it. Or as, as Marielle said, the deal breaker, when it's at low normal or is it mildly reduced, mm -hmm. strain can tell you. That's a good point. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, and strain is way bigger than, you know, cardiotoxicity monitoring. There's so many applications, clinical applications, you know, patients that may have subclinic, subclinical ischemia, you know, you can detect some of them too. You know, there's many other, you know, like uh, phenotyping cardiomyopathies. I mean, strain really uh, and, and, and application for valve disease. So I think strain is a very powerful tool. It's very important to learn it. I mean, it's not perfect like anything in life, you know, but I think that it's a good skill and, and it really helps you in the clinical evaluation of the patient and putting together all that is happening uh, around. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, I agree. I think practicing on normals. So when you have the opportunity um, to get an abnormal patient, you feel comfortable. And I think that's really one of the best advice um, we can give all sonographers out there. Um, I mean, the, the hour flew by very quickly. I wanted to thank all of you um, for taking the time to be with us uh, tonight. I think it was a very excellent uh, discussion and wonderful presentation. Thank you all for joining. Um, our next lecture is on July 12th. Um, it's going to be on point of care ultrasound. I hope um, to see you all uh, there. And um, thank you again. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it.